Okay, it's 201. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Maria Marshall. I'm the director of the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. And um, I'm just going to start off, off with uh, a welcome and to let you know that we are recording the webinar. So you'll always be able to find the content. We'll send it to you if you've registered, which you obviously have since you're here. Um, so you'll find that later on in your um, in your inbox. Um, so today's webinar is supporting rural grocery stores across the North Central region. We have three great speakers, uh, Lisa Bates from Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Um, she's the Interim Assistant Director and Field Specialist at Iowa State University Extension. Um, and Greg Schweiser, <laughs> hopefully I pronounced that right, uh, Director of Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems at University of Minnesota Extension. Um, regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, and Ryle uh, Carver uh, -State, uh, at K-State Research and Extension. She's program leader of the Rural Grocery Initiative at K-State Research and Extension. So thank you for our great speakers that are, I'm really looking forward to hearing everything you have to say since we've got, uh, not only do I look at the North Central region, but also um, the, um, in Indiana, it's been a particular problem as well in terms of rural grocery stores. So I think um, uh, we'll, we'll learn a lot. And I think we probably have a next slide to talk about our next webinar. Yes, thank you. Um, so our next webinar in December, is December 7th, will be an introduction to the NCR STAT, the free household data set that is now publicly available. So if you're interested in um, data about the North Central region, um, you'll feel, uh, hear all about it at our December webinar. And so with that, I'll um, leave it to Lisa to start us off on our webinar. All right, thank you, Maria. So just to, to start off um, here, again, I'm Lisa Bates with Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. And today I was going to start us off with um, a little bit of the history of where Iowa State University Extension and Outreach started working with grocers, um, where we've headed to um, working both with Minnesota and Kansas, and where we're at right now um, in a current project. So for in, I, I would say about 2015, um, we were funded by the Leopold Center here in Iowa to take a look at the status of Latino tiendas or grocers across Iowa. And we had an expanding Latino population that looked at tiendas um, that offered products specifically chosen for their cultural, their culinary needs, things that were familiar to them. And with this particular project, um, we explored how Iowa had an increasing local food production potentially could become a part of produce offerings at these types of specialty stores like Tiendas. Just to give you a little background into the state, when we took a look at this, um, this particular map shows you our population density um, person per square miles. And the little black dots are the Latino food stores identified um, across our states. So you can notice that they are in uh, more densely populated areas, but we have quite a few that are in our rural areas as well. Oops, excuse me. This one also uh, shows both density and tienda layers given the context of our Latino population as a percent of the total. Uh, population. So you can see that these were really entrepreneurs that are looking to open up and meet the needs of their local area. And again, it gives us the context of um, looking at these issues about both food access in rural Iowa, but also for Latinos in Iowa. So some of our findings with this project is um, looking at, you know, what the store looked like, the characteristics um, there were a spectrum of store types that we had in our project, including a startup, a growth, and what we called full capacity. Employee numbers ranged from a single owner operated to a small number to um, a, a very, I would say, a small number of uh, employees overall, like many of our um, independent grocers run with. They also do a complementary products and services. So we'll start to see different complementary merchandise, products, services, including money orders, phone cards, check cashing. So things that their uh, local community needed in addition to uh, the groceries as well. 
Merchandises also came um, up within. So we were looking at uh, specific cookware, um, over-the-counter kind of brands that they're familiar with, arts and crafts, media. So things that, again, they're more uh, familiar with, with maybe um, some of the other areas that they lived before moving to um, Iowa. They were leasing retail space um, many times to other vendors for um, maybe different types of services and merchandise. Um, so we had some um, examples such as a jewelry store and a shoe repair store within the grocery. Um, and they really differed based off um, to the traditional retail businesses um, that we saw um, across our rural areas. Uh, when you look at a lot of our Anglo um, brochures, we found, you know, produce is one of the core. It might be one of that first departments that you see. Um, but for Latinos, it was either an add-on or it was non-existent in our Latino markets. So we were really looking at um, making sure that not only were was fresh produce available at Tandem Markets, but also making sure that they're, they met the, the fulfill that cultural quiz, cuisine requirements so that the taste, the aesthetic, the texture, shape, quality, those will all be culturally familiar to the customers. So there's different types of cheeses. Um, one thing that we found was with Roma's tomatoes, the ripeness of the tomato, you won't find um, the same as traditional Anglo markets. Um, you will not find baby or skinny carrots. You'll only find the large carrots for grating and making it a salad. So it really depends on, on uh, the recipes of, of their local area. Some of those fresh pr produce challenges we found is, um, you know, we were really looking at produce as one of the higher profit market items um, that Tiendas could have. Uh, but they face distribution challenges, especially in the rural areas, getting it to the rural areas, again, being culturally familiar, making sure they're fresh and high quality and also the price. So some of those challenges were meeting some of the minimum order uh, quantities for small scale distributors, uh, the seasonal availability, product turnover was hard in some places to avoid spoilage. So some of the ways that we found that Tienda owners are um, looking at those distribution challenges is they'll become their own distributor. So they'll drive to hubs, um, might be once a month to weekly, depending on uh, how, how much they turn over their produce. They're contracting with distribution companies. So they'll usually look to build personal relationships with the company um, or happening at a warehouse as they're their own distributor over time. They may not be stocking items like fresh produce, and they may be buying items unripened. So they'll look at buying a jalapeno when it's green and chipotles when they're red. They're also looking at lower quality items. Maybe they are infrequent when having them on the, in stock. So maybe their customers won't know all the time if they have them in stock. And then they'll also buy frozen items instead of fresh to meet some of that demand. So we would look to really want to help increase that economic, imp economic impact of stores and fresh produce on the bottom line for Tiendas. And we identified some opportunities and some barriers with this project. So some of those included um, making sure that uh, we do some promotions or advertising. So it was very, it was found that uh, very little connection to uh, local suppliers, local growers, but also there was very little promotion or advertising if any local products were being were for sale, including within produce and, and the meat market as well. I'm also looking at how do you how do you help with uh, spoilage issues? So some also had uh, within the family, they might have restaurants, so they would use those products before they turned, in their restaurants, but they were looking at exploring full meals, grab and go, or prepackaged meal kits. Also looking at what are possibilities for distribution partnerships. So if you can't meet the minimum on your own, how can you partner with other Tienda owners in the area to get those culturally specific items in your area? 
Some of the barriers included, again, the spoilage, so making sure things were turned um, and your order quantities um, were fresh. We're looking at uh, some of the food regulations were unknown to many of the, the Tienda owners. So what could they could do and what they couldn't do necessarily with some of their fresh produce. And then there was also some language and cultural barriers that they're looking to overcome within the Tienda business as well. So unfortunately, after we had our findings, our next place was to take this and connect uh, a project with connecting producers to Tiendas, but unfortunately our Leopold Center in the state was defended and so we were then moving forward with additional opportunities. And one of those additional opportunities came from the NCRCRD Small Grants Award, where um, we looked at the project between Iowa State, Kansas State University and the University of Minnesota to look at resources um, for locally uh, owned groceries as sites of food security, social centers, and economic opportunities. And so this application we came through in 2018, and it provided really planning funds um, to review existing resources and efforts, identify gaps where development of additional resources were needed, and begin discussion on the potential for creating curriculum for working through with independent grocers throughout the region. So just a little overview of this project, we first did uh, meetings virtually to really learn about each other. So we had known that there were things going on across uh, these different states, but we were looking to dive a little bit deeper and identify some of those resources programs that were happening in each state. What are some of the assets within each state? What were things that we knew from past or current research? And what were some of those best practices that were coming up that we could learn from each other? Then we came together during a, a two-day facilitated session in Ames, which you'll see both Greg and Ryle in the photo here, I believe. Yep. And uh, so we had a, a working session where we really looked at uh, coming together, again, having um, those really facilitated, concentrated discussions on what we could do. And through that, we came from um, determining uh, some objectives. So one of the objectives was to really look at compiling informational resources um, and comprehensive resources from the region. Um, from those uh, resources that are existing, we could identify those gaps. Um, that deemed the need is. So some of those gaps included business operations and transitions, grocery network and competition, and consumer education. So those were the three big areas that we were looking at um, as gaps from our, our day's events together. And then we were looking at also what's the best format for resources? So what, what could, um, what's the best way to reach our grocers? And um, how could they consume that information? So fact sheets, videos, websites, what were some of those areas that would best work? Our second objective was really looking at piloting uh, these resources to determine the effectiveness and the utility. Um, and that was uh, going to happen, which we found out later was actually during the pandemic. Um, so we weren't able to do that um, through some of our uh, ongoing funding. Uh, but then objective three was looking at curriculum. So really working one-on-one -on -one with grocers to test the appropriateness, the intent of the team, and looking at uh, local grocers throughout the U.S. as well. So this was um, really looking from each state's land grant um, missions um, and their extension professionals to help implement this work. From there, we've actually moved forward together and we are currently working on an, an ag marker, our agricultural marketing resource center project um, that's currently going on right now. Again, with the three states with grocers in mind, um, we're working with them to take a look at both grocers and producers and what is the current relationship between grocers and producers what are some of those opportunities and barriers? So uh, to start off with, we know that um, both Kansas and Minnesota had been completing surveys with their grocers in recent history. 
including Minnesota in 2020, Kansas completed theirs within 2021. And in Iowa, we hadn't completed a survey or surveyed our grocers that I know of. Um, and so we decided to go out, identify all the grocers in Iowa and surveyed them in 2021 with also the idea, the intent to identify potential grocers that would be a part of this, uh, this new study with us to look at potential relationships with producers. So here's kind of an overview of this particular grocer producer project with really looking to understand again, those opportunities, limitations for sourcing and selling local um, produce, local products in groceries. And the interviews we had 30 per state and that meant there were 15 grocer and 15 food and farm businesses, which included aggregators, farms, and then value added producers as well. We are now in the next part. We've completed interviews and we are now have gone into the coding and output phase where, um, and I'll get into the coding phase here in just a second and um, our final steps. But we're really looking at four key areas within this project. And that meant relationships, demand, logistics, and layout. And so we spoke to um, both uh, grocers and producers about these four areas. And within each area, we coded them for strengths, challenges, and opportunities. And so right now we're going through that data and uh, going and uh, starting to take a look at what are our findings per state and what are some of the findings across the region. So we'll be putting that final report together here within the next month and a half, and that will be published publicly um, on the AgMark website here. A few other aligned projects that we have going on here at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach include a mobile pro produce processing project where we have a small cart that are looking at how can we go in a food safe facility, um, but maybe doesn't have the infrastructure to start some light processing on produce. Then we'll be looking at a scaling up produce processing project in the next couple of years that we have funding at to look at that next scale. So we're looking at not only within producers, but also looking at grocers, wanting to look at how we can move um, more produce and how we might be able to value add produce into the grocers as well. And then we have ongoing community retail support here at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach through the Iowa Retail Initiative, which really looks at bringing community retail leaders, community uh, decision makers together, and really making sure there's a web of support for entrepreneurship and retail at the local level. And that is my contact information, but I'll here, I'll stop my share. And I think we'll move on to the next presenter. Hi, so I think I am the next presenter. Let me share my screen here so I can figure this out. And there we go. Everybody can see it, right? Yep. All right. So I am Greg Swazer with the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Um, I'll talk a little bit today about our um, our the last 10 years or so of our work in rural grocery stores and how we came about doing this work and why we do it. Uh, to start with, though, a little bit of explanation of my program and why we're why we're here. Um, I'm with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. We're a program within the University of Minnesota Extension, and we work specifically in greater Minnesota on sustainable development issues that are brought to us from the community in areas of clean energy, natural resources, resilient community, and sustainable agriculture and food systems. So I work statewide on sustainable agriculture and food systems. We have uh, five regions, Northwest, Northeast, Central, Southwest, and Southeast, each one with an independent board of uh, citizens and university faculty. And then each board, each, each of these focus areas has a work group that um, allocates uh, university and state funding towards small scale projects to connect with University of Minnesota resources. 
So um, we've long ago uh, identified rural grocery stores as um, a, a vital force in our rural communities, like schools. When a community loses a grocery store, a small community, things start to go downhill and uh, the community suffers. And so we've been uh, working with rural grocery stores in our community resilience area and our uh, local food area, and as well as our clean energy areas, you'll see coming up here. So uh, rural grocery stores also, as we know, provide vital food access for rural residents, many of whom are um, maybe elderly and not able to just drive down to the next community 40 miles down the road. So it's uh, an important uh, source for food for uh, many uh, rural residents. And um, we've also long thought of rural grocery stores as an opportunity to strengthen our local food systems in Minnesota as a way to provide a marketplace for farmers, for local farmers. But later, we've really started to look at other ways that rural grocery stores become a vital part of our community food systems, um, not least just as a, a spot to provide uh, access to foods, local or otherwise. Um, let's see here. We began working on rural grocery store issues, started in about 2007, when the owner of TJ's Country Corner in Mattawa, Minnesota, which is about uh, 30 miles southwest of Duluth, pretty rural area, very rural community, uh, joined our Northeast board. And so that was uh, an exciting push for us to get a rural grocery owner on our, on our board. Uh, around that same time, see 2007, we had um, some faculty and student researchers in the Department of Applied Economics start to do some research and survey rural grocery stores in the Northeast region in particular. Uh, this was a time when um, local foods as a phenomenon was not very widespread yet um, in rural communities. Uh, it was starting to pick up, but nowadays where you might go into a grocery store, most places and see local apples, for example, this time of year back then, that was something you might see in the Twin Cities, but not everywhere. And so we had, uh, you know, hundreds of rural grocery stores that did not carry products uh, made by local farmers. And we wanted to know why. So we went out and did some research and questioned everybody and found out, <laughs> lo and behold, uh, rural grocery stores had no problem selling local products, local farm products, just nobody had come to ask them. It was the main barrier. Uh, nobody came to ask to sell their products. So that was a bit of an eye opener. We started to look into uh, rural grocery stores as part of the local food system at that point. So um, those are our beginnings. Moving on, we began to attend the Rural Grocery Summit that is uh, um, usually in Kansas. Uh, we went. I went there twice in Kansas, so I don't know if it happens in other states as well, but the um, Rural Grocery Institute in Kansas was hosting these at least, and uh, we had an opportunity through part of a grant to bring rural grocers on a bus, charter a bus, and fill it full of rural grocery store and farmer folks in two separate years, and it was a great opportunity just to get people together to network, to talk about their shared problems and solutions and opportunities and all these things. So 2014-2016, um, we took two busfuls, uh, one each year to, um, let's see, it was uh, Manhattan, Kansas one year and Wichita the next. So great opportunity just really to get people working together. Um, the next couple of years, uh, we had a COVID problem, so we didn't go that time. Um, so unfortunately, maybe we'll get it uh, back into gear the next time around. So something to look forward to. Still though, while we're doing this work in rural grocery stores, we're connecting uh, rural grocers together. There's still not an awful lot of awareness in the state uh, beyond us uh, about the plight of rural grocery stores. Uh, one in our Southwest region, we had a just a, a regular board meeting, but as part of that board meeting, we uh, had a panel for, of rural grocers. So we brought a few rural grocers, I think three or four from the Southwest region and uh, brought them in front of the audience of, uh, of our board members and some work group members, just started asking, you know, uh, please explain your operation and we'll talk about some of the challenges you face and try to find ways that we can help. So it was a good opportunity really just to bring grocers in front of community members and um, let everybody 
become aware of the of the situation. And one of the things that came out of that panel was that the grocers and, and some of the other participants identified that we really need to conduct a survey of rural grocery stores to get a better and more broad understanding of what some of these challenges that everybody is facing. What what are some of these challenges and what are all the challenges and get get some more in-depth information. So we conducted a rural grocery store survey. We worked with the university's uh, center for, uh, oh, what's the center for uh, survey research and uh, put together a very broad and comprehensive survey, a paper and pen survey that we mailed out to all rural grocery stores in Minnesota in towns of less than 2,500 people. There are, um, let's see, I think there were 80 questions, 79 questions and 18 pages. It's a pretty onerous survey to take, um, to fill out. And despite that, we had 171 grocers or 69% respond. So we thought that was a pretty good sign. Uh, it looked like based on some of the responses, people were just excited that somebody was paying attention to real grocery stores. You know, it's a, a sector that's been struggling for a long time out there in their own. And now it looks though that people are um, waking up and identifying the problems and the struggles. And so people were just excited to get some, some time with us. So we got a pretty high response rate. Pretty excited about that. We asked questions from everything from um, ownership models to the open hours, the number of employees people had, what their gross sales were, were whether they bought food from farmers, um, how old their equipment was, what are their biggest challenges, transition plans, et cetera, all sorts of things. are very comprehensive and we got a lot of really good information out of that. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of the responses at all, but um, if you're interested in looking over some of our responses, you check out our rural grocery website here. All this information is there, z.umn.edu backslash RSDP, which is our Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, RG for Rural Grocery Stores. So z.umn.edu, RSDP, RG. And check it out. Let us know if you have any questions and um, give you a good opportunity to really look through all of that stuff. Um, let's see. A uh, brief overview, many of our challenges that we found is that rural grocers said they wore multiple hats in their community. Often um, they are the general manager, the, the uh, grocery produce buyer, the, you know, they do, they do everything in the store. They're, they're doing more, th more things than uh, normal humans can keep up with at once. And so some of their challenges because of that were things like produce upkeep, hard to keep up your produce when you're doing everything. Uh, aging equipment, some equipments, you know, 50 to 70 years old even, which is very inefficient, costs a lot of money to keep running. Competition from everything from big box stores and far off communities to dollar stores, which are starting to, at this point, starting to uh, grow on the landscape in smaller communities. It's a smaller customer base as many rural communities shrink over time. Stocking produce and, and merchandising, really making things look good is a problem. Um, ownership transition, it's hard to find people to take over uh, businesses when uh, people are looking to retire. Um, there's aging buildings and high energy costs. So um, if we go back, the, the survey, the results of the survey, we were able to put, up, put together several uh, press releases. We really got a lot of, a lot of uh, um, awareness spread about uh, about rural grocery stores from that survey. We were carried in all of the newspapers, the Star Tribune, Pioneer Press, NPR, uh, Minnesota Public Radio, at least there were just a, a lot of stories coming out. And so it became pretty widespread, you know, the, the information we were generating from that survey. And one of the really positive, in my mind, positive results that came out was the state legislature, the Minnesota State uh, Legislature, put together this Good Food Access Fund. And this Good Food Access Fund is really intended to help rural grocery stores and small stores replace some of that aging equipment out there. So there are grants and um, cost share grants to help uh, grocery stores really purchase newer equipment, replace some of those aging coolers that are just sucking energy out. Um, so it was intended for for-profit, non-profit grocery stores, um, and also uh, stores in food deserts. So um, I think many of us know the definition of food desert is 
is uh, interesting, you know, a grocery store in a food desert, how does that work? Well, um, you know, there's um, issues about uh, gross sales, annual gross sales. So small stores that don't meet that annual gross sale can still be in a food desert, even if they're selling uh, food as primary business. But they're really important because those are the areas that really have the biggest challenges um, with their grocery stores a lot of times. So the um, that fund, the Good Food Access Fund, over the years, the last four or five years has really grown and it's becoming a really good resource for grocers to looking to um, help uh, buy better equipment. Um, other things we've done after that survey, uh, you know, we found that uh, produce handling and keeping produce quality, uh, high quality was a challenge. So we put together a produce handling toolkit, which has um, a number of different resources from purchasing locally grown products to help people understand how that process works, to storing and handling fresh produce, and then merchandising techniques as well. And so things like how do you make your, your uh, produce that you bring in look really good? Because we find a lot of people just take the box, open up the top and put it out there and it's not necessarily very appealing. So um, we're trying to help people uh, really make the product shine. We also put out this quick reference guide so that uh, you know a high school student or, or even the owner, whoever it is who's working the produce that time can go and take a peek really quick and see you know, all right, tomatoes, they don't want to be in the refrigerator, they want to be out, peppers want to be, in, you know, whatever the case might be, uh, to help people really uh, treat the produce correctly, how it's supposed to be uh, stored in the cooler. Um, we, we have that available online. Some of the tools we were able to distribute to all of the people that filled out our, our survey, or even I think all the people that took, that got the survey and didn't fill it out even. So, um, so uh, we really had some funds for a while to really, um, do that kind of direct support through a couple of grants. Uh, we also were able to go out to rural grocery stores and conduct um, produce merchandising and produce handling workshops. And we did this targeting rural grocers and farmers. So we brought farmers and grocers together and did some uh, training, did some uh, presentations, gave people the opportunity really to connect with each other learn about each other and um, and hopefully we built some actual uh, business relationships there but in addition to that really just showing people how to make that product shine we did produce aisle audits and so we'd go in and, and look at what the produce looked like ahead of time and then we went and did this uh, training demonstration workshops then went back a few weeks later and looked at the produce aisle again to see if it had actually helped and people you know really did um, were able to uh, make their produce pop a little bit better. So glad for that. Other things we've done is just put together a few case studies of uh, farmers and grocery stores that worked with each other or farmers or grocery stores that have uh, unique things about them that, uh, that um, make their business stick out. So like um, TJ's Country Corner, uh, Mattawa, they have, uh, they specialize in meat and sausage. They have uh, a half of their store is as unique meat products. And so a lot of people go there for that. So it helps bring more people into the store. And Gosh's grocery store and Grandpa G's have been working with each other to sell each other's products or the Gosh's is selling local product from Grandpa G's. So just case studies to give people ideas of new things they can try or how they might go about doing things. Um, we've worked with um, a Somali grocery store in um, St. Cloud in central Minnesota on a Healthy Foods, Healthy Lives grant. This grocery store is interested in getting more people to buy produce to stock so they could stock produce and make it more um, attractive. And so um, we worked with a uh, surface design class at the University of Minnesota here and had students build and design these posters that they could put up in the store to encourage the um, shoppers to go out there and, and just buy more produce. So um, it's funny because some of the stores, you know, there's a um, local foods, but um, we also have avocados and those aren't quite local here, but, you know, it gives people, a, you know, just a good sense for the types of, you know, advertising for fruits and vegetables in a really unique kind of way. So that was pretty neat. And um, additionally, another store in central Minnesota, we worked, they, they approached us, they wanted to put, do their own sort of uh, produce advertising uh, program. So they worked with the surface design class as well to um, 
create these little ads for different products. They So we took pictures of people in the community like Travis and Brady here and Johnny and Bev and talked about what their favorite produce items were and then uh, turned those into little posters you can stick in the shopping cart. So when people are shopping, they see that oh, Travis and Brady love squash. Maybe we should try it too. And so it gives little uh, suggestions for how to serve different fruits and vegetables. It was a pretty neat, um, neat idea. Something we were able, interesting way we we're able to connect with our some of our students in classes. And then um, later on, we've been doing a lot of talking and thinking about how we can really integrate real grocery stores into our food supply, food system. We've talked about backhauling this concept for a while. Backhauling is something that other industries do where you take a, a delivery, full truck goes from the warehouse to the um, place where it drops off the product. And rather than come back to the warehouse with an empty truck, goes and picks up product somewhere along the way and then brings it back to the warehouse uh, full. For some reason, um, food uh, grocer distributors in Minnesota haven't been using this technique. So uh, we've approached uh, one of the um, one or two of the big distributors that serve rural grocery stores in Minnesota and asked them, hey, would you be willing to try this out a little bit? I said, yeah, sure. And so uh, we connected with a rural grocery store in Western Minnesota and a garlic producer and just to try it out to see if it would work. And we, uh, we chose garlic because it's shelf stable. It's a product that you can uh, grow and store and it doesn't need to be sold right away. So there's a little less um, need to get it moving really quickly. So uh, just as an example here, all of these purple dots, I think are rural grocery stores. And then our orange dot here is uh, the grocery store we worked with. The blue dot is our distributor. We've got a garlic grower right next to the orange dot. When the when the distributor goes down to Clinton to, to drop off a load, it can pick up the garlic from the grocery store itself and drive it back to the warehouse to sell it. So it's an interesting project. We uh, we we learned a little bit. We weren't really we didn't backhaul a lot of product. It was sort of a one off, but we really just wanted to kind of see what would happen and see what we'd run up against. And we found out that, you know, some of the things, food safety was a big issue. Garlic is a unique product because it's not often consumed raw. So it doesn't fall under some of the um, food safety regulations that other product does. But still, the distributors have their own food safety requirements. So we had to help the grower understand how to go through GAPS training. We looked at regulations, simple, easy. It's a, it's a um, produce item. So the farm is a is an approved source, so the um, grocery, the the vendor, the distributor can just pick that up without worrying about regulations. Um, backhauling logistics and relationships and project packaging and pricing were all things that kind of were a little bit shaky, and so um, we are going to look at those things in a second backhaul project. We're going to try this again and try to scale it up with a few different pro uh, products. Still looking at shelf stable things like garlic. Um, and then potatoes and organic potatoes, see if we can keep that chain of command going, make sure they stay organic and uh, packaged oatmeal product that a, a farmer in Western Minnesota developed. So we're, we're trying to still scale it up a little bit and see if we can learn more and try to get back hauling it as a, a, an option for farmers and grocery stores to, to get their product into the mainstream food supply. Uh, stay tuned, we'll see how it goes. We're in the middle of, of some of that right now. And uh, hopefully we'll have some good things to report in a year or two. Uh, we did a second rural grocery survey recently. Didn't get as big of a, um, a response as the first one, but 55% um, response rate nonetheless. This wasn't as comprehensive, but um, some of the themes we explored were um, how stores saw themselves as their role in the community, um, and looked at competition and local foods and uh, stores as innovators. And so some of those things um, like uh, that we identify, oh, here we go. Um, those grocery stores really, 96% of them really agreed that uh, they have a responsibility to their wider community. They serve a purpose and they they know that they're, they're needed even if, um, even if they, they struggle economically. So they're they're there and they're there to help their communities. 
Um, 79 percent of the folks live in the same community as their store um, and uh, 94 percent would like to spend more time with family and friends but are really putting their business first so there's a there's still that that crunch on these real grocery stores people are feeling the, the um, time commitment hit so it is still a problem uh, one of the issues that we went to explore further in there is one of the questions have you turned away any farmer selling locally grown or processed foods because you were uncertain about the regulations for purchasing food from farmers? And 29% said yes. And so we um, wanted to address that a little bit more in depth. We compiled a bunch of resources that we already had and added a few new things and built this farm to grocery toolkit, which uh, helps farmers and grocery stores connect to each other to um, sell product and have a better understanding of what the regulatory barriers are and are not based on um, different, oh, so, what happened. so uh, based on what the products are. So things like produce, um, no requirements for uh, regulatory issues, just go on and sell. Other things, meat and eggs might be a little bit more difficult, but anything that a grocery store or a farmer needs to know, they should be able to find this this toolkit. And um, there are also ideas for helping people get together and work together. So we're excited to put that up. I see, I'm kind of running late. So I'll try to rush through here a little bit. Um, a little bit more grant support, the um, Good Food Access Fund that we um, that the state has, we've now got support to help grocery stores apply for that funding. If not all grocery stores are um, have the time and, and skills to write grants like a lot of us university folks do. So we're helping by putting university people, um, helping us get connected with grocery stores to help fill out that grant for them so that it's a simpler process. Um, 2020, COVID came and uh, we jumped right on the bat here and developed a 14-day meal kit uh, that, that has meets all of the nutritional requirements for um, a person and um, and we help people get this put together based on commonly available items in rural grocery shelves so that people could put together a two-week meal kit and sell um, to uh, community members. And so it's also something nonprofits, churches, uh, individuals, anybody who wanted to could purchase these, these meal kits and um, uh, community members who needed to shelter in place could go uh, just buy them, pick them up easy, easy to just drop off a box of, of food product in a, in a trunk and then take off and have everything they need for a couple of weeks. Um, and that is where I'll leave it. If you want any information on our projects and what we've got, um, here we have the, the same website I posted earlier, z.umn.edu backslash rsdprg. So have a nice day. <laughs> Let me know if you have any, I think questions are probably coming later. So with that, I will uh, sign off and uh, pass it on. Thanks. All right, thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, so this has been exciting for me to be listening into my colleagues talking about some of their efforts. Um, it's just exciting to see how uh, we're all uh, working on this similar challenge uh, and have each taken on sort of different focus areas. And so it's nice to know that throughout the North Central region, you have a lot of resources available, um, a lot of people to turn to. So um, my name is Ryle Carver. I am the program leader for the Rural Grocery Initiative. We are based uh, within K-State Research and Extension. We, um, all of our staff are considered rural grocery extension specialists. So we work to support grocers in Kansas and beyond in the North Central region and even throughout the country. So our office or our group was first established in 2007 after a series of listening tours or listening sessions were conducted. And these listening sessions happened in rural communities across the state of Kansas where community members were asked, what are some of the big issues that you see your community facing and that you worry about for the future? And the theme that rose to the surface across the state was the long-term 
viability of their local grocery store. And so we have spent the last 15 years or so working to understand the importance of rural grocery stores and the role that the rural grocery store plays in, in small towns in Kansas and beyond. So we know, we've seen that rural uh, grocery stores fill three kind of important needs in a community. And you've heard this mentioned by each of the presenters today. So the rural grocery store is an economic driver. It is a um, contributor to the local tax base. It's an employer. This is an example of a store in South Central Kansas with um, a picture of all of their employees. Often a grocery store, a small town grocery store has a mixture of full-time and part-time employees, including some high school students that are working. Uh, grocery stores, rural grocery stores are also key access points for healthy food. So in many cases, rural communities, if they don't have a grocery store, they're traveling a long distance to find healthy food or they're paying more for healthy food at uh, convenience stores or limited service stores in their community. And then of course the rural grocery store is a social gathering place for the community. It's a, it's a community hub. It's a place where connections are built, social capital is, is built. And um, it's really a place where you see the identity of the local community come through, whether that's uh, through the uh, groups that meet for lunch on a daily basis, or maybe you see support for local, um, the local school teams or local events or benefits. It's really, uh, the grocery store is really a part of the community. And so, we see that these grocery stores are critical to the community. Um, they're critical infrastructure to a small town. And yet it is a challenging business to be in. Rural grocery stores really struggle to stay in business. Uh, between 2008 and 2018, we saw over a hundred grocery stores close in rural Kansas. The good news is that about half of those reopened either in another format or under new ownership. Um, the challenge is that about half of those have, they closed their doors and have stayed, stayed closed and that community has, has lost um, that benefit. The, the reason for this struggle to stay open is there are many reasons. So uh, the grocery industry in particular is one that has very high, uh, that has high operating costs and low profit margins. So uh, they tend to run, profit margins in the grocery industry tend to run between one and 3%, which means that for every $100 of uh, sales, 97 to 99 of those dollars are going to cover your costs. And we see that play out in particular in rural communities where these grocery stores are located in old buildings with old equipment. And when you only have one to $3 of your $100 to put back into investments in your store, it's really hard to make those improvements. Uh, we also see that competition, population decline in, in small towns, distribution as has been mentioned before, and then transition planning for uh, the future of a business are all challenges that contribute to store closures in small towns. And this is particularly relevant in the North Central region where you can see here, this is the map in purple, you see the areas in the North Central region that are considered low access as designated by uh, USDA. This is not the, the low income and low access, which would is also known as the food desert map. This is simply the locations in these re in this region where uh, residents are traveling in rural areas over 10 miles to um, to get to a grocery store. So the need for um, support in rural communities around rural groceries is is, is very clear. So the Rural Grocery Initiative uh, is here to provide resources and support 
locally owned rural grocery stores because we know that rural grocery stores are critical to a community's vitality as well as to the health of that community. And we do this in a, in a few different ways. Um, one, of, one area of, of uh, work that we do is through technical assistance. So this is individualized conversations with communities or grocers about some of the challenges they're facing. And we work with them to identify resources and solutions to consider. We've also conducted research. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of the survey, uh, rural grocery surveys we've done. Uh, we maintain and develop a variety of resources relevant to rural grocery house and house that on our website. We've hosted educational events for many years now, including the National Rural Grocery Summit and a few others like some of our webinars and workshops. And then we're also a partner with the Kansas Healthy Food Initiative, which is a financial and technical assistance program for uh, healthy food retail in the state. So to dig into this a little bit more, tech, our technical assistance efforts really have reached uh, across the country. Since we've been tracking, uh, I think we started paying attention, tracking uh, who we were working with in about 2017. Since 2017, we've connected with individuals and communities in, in 33 states. And I'm guessing it's probably more than that just because we were around for about 10 years before we started really paying attention to the states we were reaching. And then um, we, on average, were responding to about 15 technical assistance inquiries per month, uh, which equates to about 180 per year. And our, the topics that we're able to support with range from kind of the basics of why are rural grocery stores important, as I've mentioned already today, to more specific resources related to business development, funding, ownership models, um, grocery operations, and so on. We also have developed kind of a new iteration of our technical assistance offerings within the last year or so, and that is our mentorship program. So this is our business transition mentorship program where uh, we've seen this need for uh, technical assistance related to planning for the future of a business uh, to keep it from closing. And so this mentorship program is meant to pair individual grocery stores or community members with um, mentors that have specific expertise in the phase of the transition that they're in. For instance, um, we have connected uh, a grocer that is wanting to sell their business in the next five to 10 years, but has re realized that he needs to build some value in the store. So we've connected him with a small business development center advisor that could provide some specific uh, guidance on how to build value in the store, what to bring into the store to drive sales, what, um, what changes to make in the store to make it more, uh, uh, to, to, uh, build interest in the store for a future owner. And the other side of the spectrum, we've worked with brand new owners that are new to the grocery industry and are just learning the ropes on how to run a grocery store. And so in that case, we paired them with another grocer um, that had the capacity to serve as a mentor to develop some protocols and some training materials and standard operating procedures so that that grocer was really set up to succeed from the start. So the business transition program is sort of a new um, version of our technical assistance that we've been providing since uh, last year, but and it's just for Kansas right now, but it's a, it's a type of technical assistance we're, con we're excited to continue to, to um, develop and to offer because we've seen how effective it can be to work individually on a specific project to make progress on that. Um, as you've heard from others, uh, learning from rural grocers is really important. So we have participated in and led um, a few different research studies. I've included just the most recent uh, research studies that we've led on this slide. 
um, most notably the rural grocery survey that we conducted last year. And so when we were when we first established as the rural grocery initiative, we conducted a survey in 2008, and we had not done a survey again until last year. We um, we used a similar survey from the one in 2008 with some additions. Um, obviously, this was in the midst of the pandemic, so we added in a few questions related to that. The survey, um, we haven't yet finalized or, or uh, submitted a final, published a final report, but we're very close to doing that. And we have been using some of the results from that survey to guide our work into the future. For instance, uh, you've noticed already that business transition planning is a key area, focus area for our office. And that primarily was because we saw in the rural grocery survey that um, one in four of the grocers were planning to retire in the next five to 10 years, but 80% uh, had no transition plan in place. And so we really see that as an area of need for our office to support in continuing to have uh, rural grocery stores and, and access to healthy food in communities. So we also have informational resources on our website. We've uh, developed and maintained the Rural Grocery Toolkit for many years now. This is split into kind of two audiences. There's step-by-step -step information for those wanting to establish a rural grocery store, and then some buckets of information related to, um, or for grocers that are already open and wanting to make some improvements to their store. Uh, this is all available on our website and I've tried to include the links so that you could um, come back through and find all this information later. We also have developed a variety of fact sheets similar to what Greg was saying. Some of these fact sheets and success stories are highlighting innovative approaches that rural grocers are uh, taking and others are, um, in other cases, we are uh, highlighting some of the benefits of rural grocery or highlighting some relevant information that has come up um, more recently. So the Rural Grocer's Guide to E-Commerce was something that came up in the midst of the pandemic and we jumped on trying to gather some information to share with rural grocers on e-commerce. Um, this was kind of in the midst of when grocers in rural and urban communities were implementing new methods because of the pandemic. We've also hosted a variety of events. So um, since, I guess in 2021, we hosted, the last two years we've hosted webinars related to rural grocery business transition planning. In 2021, we did an eight part series in early 2021 with some key topics that we covered in 2022. We've been doing monthly webinars also related to this topic. And um, we have two more webinars this year. The link to register is there. The next one is November 17th. All of the webinars that we've conducted are recorded and can be viewed online if you're interested. And then um, a few folks have already mentioned the National Rural Grocery Summit. This is another event that our office puts on um, every other year. So it's it's offered in the even, even years. Uh, in 2020, it was not offered though because of COVID-19. So this past June was our first summit after uh, four years. And we had over, uh, over 200 uh, attendees uh, from 35 states and Washington, D.C. come together in Wichita, Kansas. We had over 50 presentations. It was really a jam-packed schedule with a lot of great um, information and resources and networking opportunities. So we will be uh, jumping into planning for 2024 soon um, and we'll have more information there soon. We also are a partner with the Kansas Healthy Food Initiative. So this is a program, this is a public-private partnership um, that works to increase access to healthy food in low resource and underserved areas of Kansas, and actually uh, spreads RGI's reach out beyond simply rural. Um, this is open to rural communities and urban communities and everywhere in between, as long as there's a need for that type of, um, as long as there's a, a documented need 
based on some of the data that's available. So this Kansas Healthy Food Initiative is modeled after uh, what's known as a healthy food financing initiative. And healthy food financing initiatives are uh, exist across the country. There's a national one, there are some regional ones as well as state ones across the country. Ours obviously focus on Kansas. They all tend to have a partnership between um, technical assistance providers and financial institutions and ours is the same. So RGI as part of K-State Research and Extension is one of the partners. Kansas Health Foundation is a key, is the funder for this program. Network Kansas and IFF are the financial institutions that handle the loan and grant um, management for this program. And then the Food Trust is a national nonprofit that supports in evaluation efforts, as well as help, they helped us kind of develop our program. So this program has kind of taken the technical assistance and the expertise of RGI and expanded it, as I said, beyond rural into some urban capabilities and has also connected us to more producers. So producers that are interested in selling to retail outlets would be able to benefit from financial assistance through Kansas Healthy Food Initiative. And we've been able to support some of those projects. The last thing I wanted to share um, is that through NCRCRD, we recently received a small grant and are working to develop an online certificate program that we call the Rural Grocery Specialist Certificate. And the idea for this program is to train resource providers to better support rural grocers through business transitions. Um, the audience would be extension professionals, economic developers, nonprofit leaders, and others that are already supporting rural grocers, but are often looking for some specialized knowledge in how specifically to work with rural grocers and what are the specific challenges that rural grocers face. So we are in the midst of developing an online uh, course that will consist of several modules um, each module will have a series of videos and they will cover sort of skills that a resource provider might need to successfully support a rural grocer in their community. The reason I bring it up now is that as part of this year effort to develop this program, we plan to have, uh, we plan to offer a pilot and um, anticipate offering that to folks in the North Central region. So we aren't quite ready to be advertising the pilot program, but if you are interested, please uh, reach out to us. We'd love to consider you for that pilot program if that's something you'd be interested in. So I think that's all that I had. Um, thank you all so much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and thanks again. Great, thank you to our three speakers. That was really informative. I'm gonna start with some questions that were in the chat um, that you might have missed while you were talking and then open it up for others. Um, I think, Greg, there was a question about, um, can somebody get a copy of the actual survey tool that you all used? Um, is, would that be possible? Or should they contact you directly for yeah. that? Yeah, contact me directly if you'd like. Um, a copy of that. I have a couple of surveys I can send out. It's not posted online anywhere. So here, I'll put my email in the chat and anybody who wants. Thank you. And there was a suggestion by Michelle O'Donnell on the retail rescue, um, where rural, it looks like rural grocery stores could work with local pantries. And she says she's in Missouri and that your states might have something similar or call it something else. I don't know if Y'all heard of that. That was, I think, while Raul or Greg were speaking. If Michelle's on the line, you might want to talk a little bit about that. I think she looks like she's on. I haven't worked with that program, but I'm glad to know about it. And we'll definitely look into it. Okay, great. And um, then somebody was asking about the recordings for this year's Rural Grocery Summit, if those were available online. Yeah, I will put the link in the chat. We uh, did not record each presentation, but we do have 
PDFs of the presentations. So you can at least, uh, so if you look, I'll post the link to the agenda and on that page, you can click on the different PDFs from presentations there. Great. Um, and it looks like somebody just posted something in the chat um, that asked, um, uh, Greg, if uh, backhauling, let's say, did backhauling increase the profitability of the route for the distributor? Um, yes, uh, the, there is no answer to that yet, I'm afraid. We did such a small amount that it, it was really just a demonstration to see if we could do it. So um, one of the problems we found with the backhaul project is that pricing is just really difficult and, and that um, the, the distributor will set a price and will get their price, but then there's middlemen along the way that also add to the price. So by the time it makes it to the final retail destination, the prices vary from you know a, a little bit to a lot. So um, we need to figure out how to how to tackle that. If we can do that, we'll be able to figure out the profitability of the distributor because it all you know ultimately it only matters if the product sells in the end. So um, we don't know yet. Uh, but, you know, with the price of gas is going up and, and everything fluctuating from year to year now that um, there is interest. We know that others do it and are and um, and are able to and it, it helps the bottom line for other distributors, but just not the ones that we have in Minnesota. So there's nuts. To, the, the nut needs to be cracked. It's possible, but we just haven't gotten there yet. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer than that. Great. Thank you. Um, I think now, um, unless you want to put more questions in the chat, you can also um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question for any of our three speakers. Or if you're shy, if you're shy you can also put it in the chat. <laughs> I might do a brief one. Uh, so my name is Parker. I work for MSU Extension, um, Food and Ag Business Development. Greg, I asked you the question before about um, backhauling because I work in northern Michigan and we have similar problems to uh, Minnesota. And we've looked at backhauling for a bit, uh, but retailers, distributors, some challenges there. So you have your garlic producer on one end and then you partner with a distributor in the middle and then you're getting to a retailer did this retail relationship already exist and then you help the distributor move the product there or did you help them get the retail relationship to have the the pull of uh sales no the pull is something that we need to address a little bit more too what we did was got the garlic at the distribution center and then it went into the catalog so <laughs> essentially what we have is um a farmer being able to offer a product to locally, uh, and this got them into the capacity to offer a product across the three state region. And so we were selling, they were, there were stores in Iowa and Michigan buying it as well as Minnesota buying that product. But once it got there, you know, from some, from some of the problems in the middle, the black box in the middle, <laughs> it, it made things a little haywire. But what we, what we wonder though, is if there's, if you know what exactly can that pull be, whether it's um, shelf talkers or um, merchandising, you know, for, for our oatmeal producer, they're working on developing a, you know, a, just a facing, a, a front facing design on the product that looks nice. Um, it's one thing to do uh, to do that on a small scale because you can have your local people call the grocery store and say, if you buy this, I'll buy it, you know. But it's another thing to do it when you have. A potential market of uh, several million or hundred thousand, because it's harder to do it. You know, you'd have to have a real big orchestrated um, region, multi-region wide campaign. So, if it comes to that, we can do that. But at this point, we still just don't know. <laughs> we're we're still small beans here. So, we, you know, there's there's a lot to be figured out yet. I was hoping you would have cracked every single nut and then I oh. could just receive <laughs> without the kernel. Um, one other question for you, though, because I, I talk with distributors and I work with food processors. A lot of the reasons why distributors don't want to work with small, smaller businesses is because of the transaction costs. They don't know what they're supposed yeah. to do. They don't have the certifications. They have to talk on the phone all the time. Um, how did you get around that with your program of making it easy on the distributor? For the backhaul. For the backhaul. Yeah. yeah. Um, we just, it was a, 
It was a test project. We had regular calls with the distributor, with the farmer, with the project team, and we just kind of worked through it. We had a situation where the distributor was interested and willing to work with us and helped us devise it throughout the, the plan. So there was a lot of back and forth and there was a lot of handholding and that kind of thing. So and what we'd ultimately like to see in the end is to develop some sort of uh, guidance where we can help people just make it be a, a drop and play kind of thing so that people don't have to do all that middle uh, middle work. Awesome. Well, I would have more questions, but there's other people here. So uh, sure. Godspeed. I hope it's finished <laughs> soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great. More questions? I just wanted to add on the distribution side, this isn't as much of a distribution solution for getting local food into rural grocery, but um, we have seen some distributors start to be more open to having um, kind of different, having one store order for more than one account. And that can, which meaning order for more than one store, which can sometimes be a helpful option for your really small grocery stores. It the, the challenge I think in every area is that you are kind of beholden to the distributor that's in your area and what level of openness or willingness to try new things uh, they, they have. So I think like anyone that's really working with rural grocery stores, um, it behooves you to identify those players and build some relationships with the grocer with the grocery distributors. I guarantee that part of the reason that Minnesota and their backhauling project has continued is because of the relationships with the distributors that they've they've built. Um, and if you can kind of bring them on into the conversation then hope you know hopefully you could make some progress there okay um last call for questions well um thank you for attending today's webinar um this was really really interesting i think something that everyone across the north central region is struggling with that was a very interesting map now i'm i can't remember which person put it up now but the map with the the low access so that's something obviously that uh we're all struggling with the need to work on um so thank you again for attending the webinar everybody um and um to our speakers of course uh Thank you very much for all this information. And you can, of course, as always, follow us on social media, our email list, our newsletter, our website, um, and um, get the great webinars that, that hopefully we continue to bring you. And with that, have a wonderful week.